Around the World and Back, Chapter 13. The next two and a half months were spent hiring a staff, getting ready to move yet another time, deciding what to do about our homes in Texas and Maine, and celebrating Christmas. I have read that Nancy Reagan considered me lucky because I was not a newcomer to Washington and knew what to expect. That is very true, but I also knew enough to hire the most perfect person to be my chief of staff, Susan Porter Rose. Susan knew Washington and knew her way around the White House. I met her when she was a very young woman working for Pat Nixon. She went on to be Betty Ford's scheduler and then worked in the Justice Department during the Carter years. Susan has the most extraordinary sense of what is right and thinks things through with great care. I don't. Therefore, we made a great team for 12 years. Susan saved both George and me from many mistakes, and for that we are both eternally grateful. She also ran the very best office and hired the very best staff, many of whom would stay with me for the next 12 years. Susan is married to Jonathan Rose, whose father, Chappie, was a friend of George's dad. Both Mr. Rose and John were highly thought of by all. The day after the election, Joan Mondale called me in Texas and couldn't have been nicer. She offered to show me the vice president's house any time I wanted to see it, and she received me with great kindness several weeks later. My wonderful friend Andy Stewart went with me. Andy is one of those people who pulled out a tiny camera to record moments of history. She humiliated me during the visit by insisting that Joe and I pose shaking hands upon arrival and several other times during the tour. That's when I knew Joan was sincerely a nice person. She agreed to pose over and over. Joan is a great supporter of the arts, and the house was filled with the most modern work. Andy would back us up to some amazing piece of neon art that she and I thought was hideous and insist that we pose. She knew that George would last about five minutes with most of the pieces in the house. Let me add as a footnote that we know absolutely nothing about modern art, so this should be taken as a knock at our ignorance rather than a slap at Joan's taste. I should also add that you rarely see any of the pictures Andy takes. She keeps them in drawers or under beds. The moment the election was over, George generously suggested I go to New York City and buy some designer clothes. He didn't want me to have to wear to hear about how dowdy I was. So I took Laurie Firestone, the magical young woman who was our social secretary for the next 12 years, and bought some clothes from Bill Blass and Adele Simpson, both of whom had visited China while we were there, and Diane Dickinson. Later I would meet Arnold Scazzi, and for the next 12 years I bought my clothes from these very talented people. I never was criticized, but I didn't draw raves either. Nobody noticed what I wore. All I know is that I felt terrific. All these designers were very kind to me, but Arnold became a close personal friend and a supporter of my literacy causes. On that first visit, I bought a great purple dress and a red coat to wear to the inauguration, a pretty bright blue coat with a white dress, and several other things. Thank heavens Nancy Reagan slipped the word to me that she was wearing red. In my excitement, I had forgotten that I was not the mother of the bride and never thought to ask. So I wore the blue coat instead, and it was fine. All our children had to buy long evening clothes, and we had great fun doing it. They looked beautiful. That red coat and purple dress gave me a good laugh later in the year. In May, the Archbishop of Canterbury visited Washington, and George and I attended a service at the Washington Cathedral with His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. An unusual cold front had come through Washington, and I decided to wear that outfit one more time before putting it away for the summer. As we were standing for the procession, young Prince Charles leaned over to George and said, Your wife, sir, is very appropriately dressed. We turned and looked, and there came the bishop, followed by twenty-eight primates all gowned in purple vestments with red overrobes. Inaugural week could not have been more exciting and fun for us and our children. Of course, everything did not go perfectly. 
At the Texas Ball, held a few days before the inauguration, I tripped and hit my leg as George and I were announced on stage. It stunned me for a minute, then I was okay. While George was speaking, I noticed that something felt slightly funny. I turned sideways and looked down, and I was standing in a nice little pool of blood. The military aide who had been assigned to me for that week only, a Navy lieutenant named Todd Bruner, looked like he might faint. Todd's parents were not only our good friends in Kennebunkport, but his dad, Lamont, was our minister. The minute the speeches were over, the Secret Service quietly took me into the nearest ladies' room. As the women came out of the stalls, they were slightly taken aback to see men in their room and pushed out gasping. Mr. Bill Hughes, ABC News reporter Ann Compton's husband, came to my rescue and sent me to the emergency room at Georgetown University Hospital. The Secret Service really didn't want George to go for fear rumors would start about his health. I insisted he go, and he was the rage of the nursing staff. It was Saturday night, and they had a full load of stabbings, but all was momentarily forgotten while they sought autographs. And no rumor started, thanks to the big band-aid I wore over my 14 stitches throughout the inauguration. When we went to the star-studded inaugural gala, we sat across the room from the Reagans in a great throne-like chairs. The doctor had told me to put my foot up, but I couldn't. I was afraid I'd look like Henry VIII. We began inauguration day at St. John's Episcopal Church for a service with the Reagans, our joint families, and friends. The minister, John Harper, and his wife, Barbie, were old friends of ours as we are Episcopalians. Every president since James Madison has worshipped at St. John's, located across Lafayette Park from the White House. Then it was on to the White House. Fritz and Joan Mondale met us at the North Portico entrance and were warm and gracious. They had been most helpful during the transition, despite the fact this couldn't have been an easy time for them. I'm going to skip ahead for a second. Our very first week in office, President Reagan asked George to meet the hostages at Andrews Air Force Base and escort them to the White House for their official welcome home. The entire route into town was lined with people, waving flags, cheering, and even weeping. The strangest assortment of people were hugging each other. All ages, all shapes, all sizes, all races. All Americans whose prayers had been answered. Inside the bus was a quiet disbelief. The hostages just couldn't believe that we had prayed and cared for them that we had counted day one, day two, up to the last day, day 444. As we got closer to the district, the hostages were overwhelmed by the yellow ribbons and growing crowds. Their leader, Bruce Langan, wrote thank you on a tiny piece of paper and held it up to the window. I found a bigger piece and gave it to him and he taped a big thank you onto the window. He left it on the bus, but I took it and mailed it to him a month later, thinking he might like a remembrance of that historic day. Now it goes on to discuss matters related to the first lady furnishing, I'm sorry, the second lady furnishing the vice president's house have you ever been to the Salvation Army? I mean, as somebody that has a need for services from the Salvation Army. Have you ever been to a homeless or domestic violence shelter in Texas? Anywhere in the vast and esteemed network of Christian service providers, or maybe even non-denominational, perhaps even so-called secular and yet in network possibly availed of the benefits of being identified as a faith-based organization. See, if you haven't been to the shelter as a recipient of services, you may have gone under other auspices. Maybe you have something to donate. When you donate it, you let them know what you understand about what it is, 
places usually have an understanding of the value of items that are donated. So they give you a letter, a tax letter, based upon a certain monetary value for the items you've donated. Over the course of time, those donations to charity can be tax deductible. A certain amount has a certain kind of credit. Now, if you go to one of these places, maybe the first time they take you into the store and you see what's there, maybe you're in a transition or hoping it'll be a transition, a temporary one, but you need some assistance. If you're homeless, you might get some nice clothing. Hmm? Maybe you're about to get your home and you need some home furnishings. You'd be very surprised the kinds of things that people would donate. Things that they no longer have a use for. Things they give to charity. It discusses how when Barbara Bush moved into the vice presidential mansion, which is actually a former lodging aboard a naval installation that was a house that was officially under the Department of the Navy, that she has somebody assist her with the furnishing. Apparently her method was distinct and different from the one that Nancy Reagan had for the White House. I don't think they ever stopped. I think that those donations to charity that later became a hallmark of General Bush's policies persisted even after she left the house of the vice president and moved into the White House and then came back home. Have they been using charity to assure that all those donations found their way into the most meaningful contributions to the American people? Hmm? Which American people? She makes a very specific reference in here. She says that her designer that helped her redesign the mansion of the vice president was her gift from God. Like charity. You want to say again? You want to talk again? I'm sure it was just a typo, right? The inner like the outer. The outer like the inner. Are you disappointed that I didn't go for children? Are you worried that you characterized the people that I only had an option in regards to as the ones that would return the property to the slavers? Does it make a difference if the slavers donate slaves, if they discount them? or if they bond them to a damn dime and get them certified and then auction them off in a special private session. I think we're going to have, what, 30 days to answer these questions? <laughs>